Okay, so I'm glad to see all of y'all here today on this Tuesday. So, um, a lot of thoughts in my head right now. So, I, I, I'm going to open us up with prayer, I think. Um, then I'll run through the announcements and i see if y'all have anything you want to talk about. So we definitely are going to lift up in prayer at the folks in Asheville and all of that region who are really just facing big devastation. My son, our son Chris, and his wife Amy live in Asheville. They have a four-wheel drive vehicle, so they were able to get out of town. And they are on their way here and will be staying with us for a little bit um, they arrive tomorrow afternoon. So, and I also saw that it seems that there are ballistic missiles falling on Israel right now. So, so, what? Yeah, well, those are big, Tel Aviv especially, the big population center. So if you want to kill lots of people, you know, that's, that's the place to aim for. So anyway, we want to keep, many of us have been to Israel, um, Patty and I, Patty and I have been there six times. We have good friends, some of whom live in and around Jerusalem, some in Golan Heights, and some who live in Tel Aviv. So, um, and actually, uh, King David, the bus driver, if y'all remember him, he lives down in the, King David, he, li he lives down in the south. So please, we're going to lift all those folks up, and I'm just going to ask you to pray with me. Gracious Lord, we come to you. First of all, we are grateful that we can come together here today. Um, there's a lot on our hearts and in our minds today. Um, we pray for the people of um, Asheville and in Boone County and Chimney Rock and some of these places we never heard of, but we can't even believe the pictures we see. People who are just trapped. They can't, nobody can get in, they can't get out. It's just a terrible, terrible situation. And so we pray that you will be with these folks and we pray that um, those who can deliver help in a big way will do so really fast because that that is, that is what's needed here. And, but we, we commend them all to your care. We also pray for the people of Israel today. It is on October 6th of last year, nobody really envisioned anything like what has happened in the last year since October 7th, since Black Saturday. But here we are, and now uh, missiles are again gonna be raining down, this time Hopefully, they'll be intercepted, but, but just be with the people of Israel um, in this struggle to survive, to survive, and to bring peace, a lasting peace, not this, not this constant renewal of, of, of war and rockets and bombs. It just seems to go on endlessly. Somehow, this has to stop. And we pray that it will and that Israel will be successful in bringing that to an end. So we are people of peace, um, but there is, not, there is no peace without order. There's no peace without justice. There is no, there is no, there is no peace that, that is not a peace that lasts. Um, we lift all this up to you um, in Jesus' name. Amen. I also, I should have lifted up Sandy. I hope it's okay having some surgery tomorrow. So we do commend you to God's care. Our son and daughter-in-law is having uh, minor surgery tomorrow. Um, and so every day there's prayers that we care in our hearts. And is it a great and wonderful thing that the Holy Spirit will lift up to God those prayers on our behalf. So my friends, I have a couple of announcements. I'm going to start this. Well, I say I'm going to do that. Okay, so I'm starting the podcast. Um, we just finished the prayer on this Tuesday, October 1st. And um, a couple of announcements on Thursday. Here we go. Look at this. Wait. There we go. 
I'll be doing a Revelation in the morning down here. It's a two-hour introduction to Revelation. Everybody needs a guide to the book of, book of Revelation. Everybody would really benefit from a guide to every book of the Bible. Great Bible professors and teachers, they had guides, right? Everybody learns from everybody else. And so my goal on Thursday morning will be in two hours to overcome uh, a lot of fears and ignorance about Revelation, help you see how it's put together, um, introduce you to some of the great worship scenes, uh, take the, put the four horsemen of the apocalypse in their place, and that's going to happen from 10 o'clock until noon. It is a second act event. I still hear from people, even today, who have had trouble registering. I don't know why, I don't know what the deal is, because we, we can do it, Patty can do it, she's seen it, she's, but other people are having trouble, I, I, I don't know. But you can just come, you can see back there, there are plenty of tables, there's plenty of chairs down here, and um, I, I can't promise you lunch if you're not able to register online, so if you're not able to register but you still want to come, just come and bring a lunch or come and beg from others, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's the, you know, we and all, all need to eat as much as we do anyway. Yes, Ken? And Pat, I noticed on Facebook that nothing different starting this week is also going to be doing a study on Revelation. And I wonder, I'm his, very sad. His will be, his... This is down to First Baptist Dallas. It will be different. <laughs> okay, I I think there are there are different ways of reading Revelation, but you always have to come back to it being a book that was written to comfort Christians who were being persecuted. That's the point. You, an ancillary point. It can't be about scaring Christians or scaring people into loving Jesus. And why can't it? Because you can't scare somebody into loving you. Try that when you're dating, okay? <laughs> you can't scare people into loving Jesus. You can't bribe people into loving Jesus. Our love for Christ has to come from a willing and free heart. That is the essence of what Arthur has taken to be calling free will theology, Arminian theology, um, in contrast to, to, to more of a Calvinistic approach. Um, and it simply comes back to the fact that God is love and we are made in the image of God and we should not be surprised that the two great commandments are about love, love of God and love of others and Love to be love, to be real love, the love that everybody wants has to be freely given. So the book of Revelation cannot be about terrifying people. I'll give, you, I'll give away part of Thursday. In it, there are numerous passages where the people should be scared to death, but they won't repent. You see, you can't scare people into this. So anyway, yeah, thank you for sharing that with Dr. <laughs> about Dr. Jeffers. You know, I'm, anyway. Okay, so that is coming up here on Thursday morning. It should be a trip. Yes? Uh, if, any, if anybody is interested in donating to the people that are having problems with the flood and everything, I highly recommend the Amer American Thirst. Yes, uh, that, that is... Over <laughs> Red Cross. Fran Franklin Gray, that's Frank Franklin Graham's ministry. <coughs> and they are a good place to donate to help and things like this. I was so impressed by the governor of Florida when he said yesterday, look, we don't need the help from the feds, federal agencies. We can handle what we, it came through. It came through fast. We can get to everybody. We have the resources to help. The federal government needs to head up there and pour all of their resources into that region of Western North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee, and I just thought, like, wow, I don't know the last time I heard a governor turn away, turn away resources and money, but I was, I, I was, I was impressed. 
So, okay, other things. Yes. So, since we're not part of the United Methodist Church, I know the United Methodist Church is the step party of the Reformation. We're not part of that anymore? No, we're not, because it is one of the agencies of the UMC. Um, but that particular agency does a good job, but so does Samaritan's Purse. So, so, so you can just, I, I would right now, as we have done in the past, I would give to Samaritan's Purse. That, that, but because I have confidence in Franklin Graham and what he will do with the money. Yes, sir. You mentioned that there is no peace. There is a way to have peace. Leave Israel alone. They won't bother you. Well, there is a, there, what my point is that is that there hasn't been peace for a very long, long time. And simply the, the pe peace is more than the cessation of violence. It's deeper than that. Peace, there's a Hebrew word shalom, which, which is often translated peace, but it's something deeper. It's about the wholeness. Well, you probably know that, the wholeness of what God desires for us, okay? So sure, uh, all right. The next announcement. I'm not even through with announcements yet. Look at this. No class October 18th. <laughs> Thank you for reading my own slide for me. Yes, I need that help. <laughs> October 15th, um, because they're going to be doing air conditioning work down here. So that's what's happening, and there's no other place for us to meet that day, so we will just not have class on the 15th of October. All right? So anything else before we plunge in back into the book of Acts? Okay, well, where we are in Acts is that Paul is now going to arrive in Jerusalem. So I want to do just a little bit of map um, photo stuff just to help us get oriented. Um, this is the map of Jerusalem in the day of Jesus and Paul. And um, the red arrow is pointing toward the temple. Now, the way the temple is put together is the same way the tabernacle was. You have a central building, and the tabernacle it was just a tent, the tent of meeting, within, inside a courtyard. Okay, so there'd be a fence that they could take down and move, and then bare ground, and in front of the tent you had the big barbecue and stuff. Yeah, that's what it was. So um, the same thing here. Thus notice that there is a, here's, here's the temple, huge, giant, enormous, covers maybe 23 football fields. First time Patty and I went up there, we've only been, up, been able to be up there one time because if there's any trouble in Jerusalem, uh, tourists don't go up there. They won't take them. So we've been up there one time. I was so struck by how enormous it was because have we been up there twice now? Wow, okay. <laughs> Tells you what I know. <laughs> we entered in this corner, and you could see all the way across, and it just seems to go on forever. And um, it's, it's huge. The temple that was there, twice as high as the Dome of the Rock is today. Um, it was the kind of thing that people would come. Um, I don't know if they called them tourists then or not, but yeah, the tourists would come, would come to see. Just dominating the city. Um, the, always note that up at this corner, right here, there is the Antonia Fortress, which was the barracks for the Roman soldiers. And there were, um, they could go out on the walls of the fortress and peer down into the temple courtyard. And so the Jews who came to this sacred place for them would look up, and what would they see? Roman soldiers, probably with spears, just standing there looking down into the temple courtyards. Is that where the Wailing Wall? The Wailing Wall is right, right there. There's the Wailing Wall. These are the southern steps right here. If you've been there lately, you, you've at least sat on the southern steps. This is where all the broken um, sidewalk is, where the rocks are levered off below. Um, and this is where the Dome of the Rock is. 
Okay, so now this is, I got too many gizmos here. This is a photograph of the temple, of the model in Jerusalem. I think I've, most of you have seen this photo. Uh, most of you have, if you haven't, stopped by outside um, the small chapel, right? Um, the prayer chapel, I think we're calling it now. And you'll see a model there of Jerusalem that is much like this one that was actually donated in the, by our 2011 trip group and the, the, the case, all the woodwork on it was done by Larry Phillips, who has since passed. But this is the temple, enormous, dominates the whole city. These are porticos around the edge so people can be in the shade. This is the eastern gate. Some people think there was a causeway coming out here across the Kidron Valley. Other scholars say, no, there was no causeway. You know, we, th we like to think there's great certainty about all these things from the ancient world of 2,000 years ago, and there's just not. We, we can't be certain about everything. So there's plenty for scholars to argue about, which is great because that's how they make their careers. Um, all right. So this is the third missionary. Yes? Okay, so let me go back a slide. Yep, yep. Okay. The Mount of Olives is right here. So you would be here and you would be peering down. This is, this is the Mediterranean out here. Behind the camera is the Jordan River, Jordan, well, modern day Jordan, it's east, okay? So behind the camera is east. So you're looking west and this is the Mount of Olives. And when Jesus, um, during Holy Week on Wednesday night, he leaves the temple and makes his way with disciples and sits down upon the temple mount and he weeps for the city, right? He just, you know, there, he see, he knows what's coming. He tells them that uh, the gen their generation will not pass away until they see um, Jesus' vindication. So that, and which will come in 70 AD, because in 70 AD, the Romans will come to put down a revolt and all of that stuff there will be gone. It'll be wiped clean. Those are the stones that are laying on the sidewalk beside. So this is where Paul is headed. A lot of the activity happens in the temple and in the temple courtyards and on the temple steps because that is the center of the city in every sense, in every single sense. All right. So here is the map, the third journey we've been on, and now he has been making his way back. And we left it last week when he was about to arrive back in um, uh, Jerusalem, okay? Which is just, Jerusalem is just uh, a little bit off the map right there, okay? What? Okay, okay. Let me look at the map. Okay, I see. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not seeing perfectly. So um, this is the Sea of Galilee, right? Right there, this is the Dead Sea. So yeah, there's, there's Jerusalem. Okay, very good. All right, so turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts. I will do the same thing. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, so we're at Acts chapter 21, verse 17. Does anyone dispute this? Okay, wow, good. I checked it yesterday. I'm glad I got it right. So he has been making his way, and now here he comes to Jerusalem. And there is going to be trouble, 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 trouble. And we will try to pull that apart a little bit and understand what the source of the trouble actually is. When we 
So I think Luke is still with him, right? When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. Now this would be fellow Christians, almost all of whom will be Jewish Christians because it's Jerusalem, which is predominantly Jewish, okay? The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Now, that James is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who has emerged as the leader of the Christian community in Jerusalem and who will be martyred in the early 60s A.D. and who wrote um, the little epistle um, called James in your New Testament. And I, you know what always has struck me is a long time ago somebody made this comment to me and I thought they were exactly right. That if you read, just stand back and read James, in a way you can hear Jesus' voice more clearly than you can anywhere else in the New Testament. And I think you, I think there's something about them having grown up together <coughs> that results in that. So anyway, so Paul's not going to meet with James, the leader, and all the elders, the people who are in charge of the Christian community are all present, probably like the uh, uh, finance committee and the staff parish. And so anyway, Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Because that is what Paul's ministry was. His, Paul's m primary mission was to carry the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And he's been doing that for years. This is his third journey. There was a second journey. There was a first journey. All the letters written back to places. The, many of these places had no Jews in them at all. And the Jews, where they were, were not receptive of Paul. And so it's been um, a mission of the Gentiles. It is the carrying out of the promise that God made to Abraham, that all of the families would be blessed through Abraham's family. And Jesus is part of Abraham's family. Paul is part of Abraham's family. And now the word of God, the, the, the good news about Jesus is being carried to a Gentile word, world, uh, most of whom would never have heard of Jesus. Because it's still so early, right? Well, Paul greeted these elders and, and James and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God because they understand the nature of the project, right? This rescue project, this project of salvation, redemption. I don't know what words you grew up hearing. Probably not rescue, but it's a really good word because it's about God's rescue of us from sin and death and restoring us to a right relationship with God. So when these leaders heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. Now that sentence speaks to the fact that the community in Jerusalem has grown, but the phrase that they are zealous for the law introduces us to the problem. Right? Here is the problem. What was the problem in Acts 15 that required the conference at the Hilton, at the airport Hilton in Jerusalem. When all the Christian leaders got together, what was the problem? The problem was that there were those going out, well-meaning, well-meaning. I don't, I don't cast aspersions on them. A person can be well-meaning and still be wrong, right? So, so I will say they were well-meaning. And what they were wanted to do was to say to the Gentile Christians, you need to keep the law of Moses to be a proper Christian. Right? You need to circumcise your male children. You need to keep the Sabbath on Saturday. You need to avoid pork and shrimp and all these other things. You need to be a proper Jew to be a proper Christian. And I always hear in that the phrase, 
if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you. <laughs> but the council said no. Remember, the council said no. You can't put that burden on the Gentiles. Okay? And indeed, the council that said, look, there's, we're going to ask the gen four things of the Gentiles, right? Like, don't eat meat that still has blood in it and a couple other things. You know, just kind of what? Seeking some concessions and compromising, making everybody feel like that maybe they got something right out of this conference. Now, one of Paul's earliest letters is to the Galatians. The Galatians are in, this is where the, here's Galatia, right up in here. It's an area, not a city. And he's writing to the Galatians. It might well be the first, the oldest letter we have from Paul, which would place it maybe 48, 49, on the heels of his first missionary journey. And he writes to them, and he says, I can't believe what's happening because you are already leaving, leaving what I taught you. And you're embracing this supposed gospel brought to you by people who are telling you that you have to keep the law of Moses in order to be a proper Christian. The shorthand word that we use to talk about those Christians are Judaizers, which makes sense, right? J-U-D-A-I-Z-E-R-S, Judaizers. In my mind, they don't, they're not, they're not, they're, they're well-meaning. I get it. I get it why that is their position, but they're wrong. They're wrong. And Paul is, he says, I don't care. I don't care if an angel comes and tells you something different than I told you. You believe me. That's a confident man. I love that. That is a confident man, my friends. So he goes on in the letter and he says, look, the law was like a nanny. Children benefit from a nanny because they've got to be, you know, trained and kept under control and taught how to be civilized, right? You got to civilize. Your he says the law was like that. But children outgrow the need for a nanny. They become adults. And he says the law no longer serves that purpose. We have gone beyond the law. Now that doesn't mean that the Law's teachings about loving God and loving others are all tossed aside. That's the ethical foundation of Judaism and Christianity. But the idea that we have to avoid shrimp and the rest of it, that is. Those were no longer kept by the Christians, and, and rightfully so. They had their place. They served their time. They were like like training wheels on a bike. When you're a little kid, you need the training wheels to teach you things. But as you grow, you don't need them anymore. And, and so, so this now arrives, and there are plenty of Jews, to me, unsurprisingly. Scholars fight over this, and I don't really understand why. Because to me, unsurprisingly, Jews in Jerusalem, who haven't been out there with the Gentiles, are still committed to the law of Moses. I mean, Jesus was only crucified 25 years before, to put a number on it, 26 maybe. Not much time has passed. Things move much more slowly in this world than they do in ours. Things change much more slowly in this world than they do in ours. And so, um, there's just going to be this business of Paul coming in saying, no, you don't have to keep the law that's going to be the ground that's going to be that's going to be the ground of this trouble right and you make a mistake if you think well they didn't they have the conference like in 49 and didn't that like settle everything is that how people are just because they have a big meeting and a conference and everybody's around the conference table and the conference ends and the conference sends out a little bit me little memo does that really mean that everybody agrees no. 
people, some folks go away muttering under their breath, and then they get together over the water cooler, and they're talking about. <laughs> you know, you don't have to spend much time with groups of people to realize that. So it shouldn't be surprising that this issue about the law, the law is the defining, it, it's, the def, it's, all, it's the definition almost of what it meant to be a Jew. Not quite. A Jew was the one who worshiped God. But boy, the keeping of the law is close. Joseph, we're told in the Gospel of Matthew, is a righteous Jew. You're told it, I think, maybe five times. He's a righteous Jew. What does that mean? It had a specific meaning. To call Joseph, Jesus' um, earthly father in that way, Joseph is a righteous Jew, meaning that Joseph kept the law. He kept the law of Moses. He was faithful to the law and hence faithful to God. So you put all that together and you have an explosive situation. And the elders say to Paul in verse, whatever it is, 20, all of them are zealous for the law. I remember listening to a lecture by N.T. Wright once. He said, this word zealous is an important word. The way to understand the word zealous is always to picture a knife. Zealous is a word that always has the, a knife in the hand. It's that hot. It's that passionate. Um, Simon the Zealot, who you hear about in Scripture, is a, is a Jew who is willing to get the knife out and take on the Romans in a fight. So zealous for the law is passionate, strong, ready to fight for the law because they have been struggling for hundreds of years to remain Jews under pagan oppressors, Greek influence, Greek culture, the problem with the Maccabees was that they did not, they, so, they were sellouts. They, were, they sold out to the Greek culture. So they, the Jews have been struggling for hundreds of years to remain Jews. And so the, sort of the, the, these visible boundary markers like the, the food, the diet, and the Sabbath, not surprising that there are a lot of Jews even having come to faith in Christ, that are still zealous for the law. Verse 21. Now they have, been, they have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. That's basically true, right? You only need to read Galatians to know that that is basically true. You know, it's, it's not turning away from Moses. It is coming to understand the law of Moses in its fullest sense in light of the arrival of Jesus Christ. That's really what it's about. It is about taking the law of Moses and tossing it aside. Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law, every jot and tittle, right? Jesus was a righteous Jew, but it, e like everything else in the world, everything changed with the arrival of Jesus. The world was not the same. The law was not the same. The Jews were not the same. The Gentiles cannot be the same. It is Jesus who is Lord, not Caesar. Nothing is the same. Um, it is the biggest, most important moment in all of human history. And it will always be the biggest and most important moment in human history until Jesus returns. And I guess maybe that will run a second close, a close second. So it, it's not, it, it's, it's, I mean, they, they've kind of got it right, okay? Um, because the argument over circumcision was won by Paul. As I, when we were in Acts 15, I said, look, Paul, he knows, what his, he knows what his vocation is, what God has charged him with, and he knows full well that if the Gentiles have to be circumcised in order to become proper Jesus people, most of the men are going to say no. <laughs> of course they are. So, verse 22. So they say to him, what shall we do? 
they will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. So here they are. They're going to try to come up with a plan to make Paul more acceptable. Right? Which is not a new thing to Paul's ears. Timothy had a Jewish mother, a Greek father, and Timothy was uncircumcised. Paul told him to get circumcised so that Timothy could get an audience with the Jews that he was helping Paul carry the gospel to. Yep, remember? So, this idea of doing what you need to do without... watering down the gospel, doing what you need to do to get heard because nobody can, as in Romans 10, how can they be saved if they don't hear and how can they hear if there's no one to preach the gospel to them? So, so they tell him, okay, here's what we want you to do. Verse 23, there are four men with us who have made a vow. Do we know specifically what kind of vow? No, might, might it be a Nazarite vow? Maybe, I don't know, probably not. Just some kind of sort of vow of the day. Say, by that, what does it mean? Okay, so what it means is that these four men have done something, taken a vow, maybe some other things that go with it, to sort of set them apart, to consecrate them to God for a time. Maybe not the whole lives, but for a time. So, take these men, Paul is told, join in their purification right, rights and pay their expenses. <laughs> That's always a way to try to get accepted, isn't it? <laughs> right? Just, just open up the wallet, Paul. I mean, well, let's get practical here. You know, <laughs> sure. Take these men, join in the purification rites, pay their expenses so that, they, so that they can have their head shaved. Okay, like, wow, okay, now we know. This is, this is part of what they're doing. They, 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 they are shaving their heads as part of their vow, their consecration. They're setting apart for, you know, a special thing. Okay then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. Now, there's a really fine point here. Just because Paul says to the Gentiles, no, you don't have to live according to the law of Moses to be a proper Christian, that doesn't mean Paul won't. You see what I'm saying? He's a Pharisee. Indeed, the, conference, the letter sent out by the conference in Jerusalem says, you know, if you want to live by the law of Moses, cool, fine, no problem, baby, but don't impose it upon the Gentiles. So Paul, if someone knew for a fact that Paul kept the law as best he could in terms of his diet and, the rest, and his work week and the rest of it, I would not be surprised. He didn't have to set all that stuff aside. Um, but he might well have, because his ministry, you see, is to whom? To the Gentiles. So, and it might be hard to convince the Gentiles or to, uh, to oppose the Judaizers if he himself insists upon... Um, avoiding work on the Sabbath or not indulging in a BLT. <laughs> yeah. Well, they see, that's a good question. I, I don't think it is reconciled. I mean, I think you had the conference, the letter went out, but is that the end of the story? No. What happens? What happens in corporations across America? Right? The memos go out, decisions are made, and then you find out there's a whole bunch of people who don't agree. 
and you got to get them pulled into it, you know. It's, I remember years and years and years ago, almost everything for me is years and years and years ago. <laughs> I was reading an article about management, contrasting Japanese management at the time with American managers. And American managers and corporations tended to arrive at a decision quickly and then go about building consensus, right? Kind of pulling all the people in who really don't agree. And Japanese, different approach. You build consensus, you get everybody in, and finally you arrive at a decision. So this is more like the conference met, they sent out the letter. Am I surprised there are dissidents? They're all Jews. They might have said, been fat, said like, okay, after the conference goes out, yeah, that's, that's good, let's do that. And then month one, month two, month three, month four, month five, month six, month seven goes out, year one, year two, year three, and they find themselves back in the comfort of what they grew up with. They all grew up keeping the law of Moses. It's a radical thing for these Jews to not see as an almost an ultimate goal of life, to be keeping the law. You've lived your whole life in that, right? And now in Christ, you are all of that you're told is like a nanny. If you don't stop and think about what Paul is trying to say, even that part can make you mad. Can make you mad. What do you mean I devoted myself to the law of Moses for my entire life, and now you're telling me it was nothing more than a nanny? What the heck, Paul? I'm not happy about that. I think, like, we come to the Bible sometimes, and we need to bring what we understand about people, because these are people. These are people. And decisions get made, and then differences emerge, disagreements emerge of different kinds. It just, I don't know. It just doesn't surprise, it doesn't surprise me. And there are different ways to read this, so I'm giving you what is today the Scott Engel way of, of, of reading this. But... Um, and, and now what do they want to do with Paul? They want to help him be more acceptable to the Jews by taking this vow that is supposed to convey the fact that Paul is a very careful, very careful law keeper, that he is a righteous Jew, which means keeping the law. Verse 25. As for the Gentile believers, this group says, we have written to them our deci decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality, which is basically the conference finding. So they are going to reiterate to the Gentiles, you know, the conference find, the, the conference de decision from some years before. And I don't see any reason to call this like some duplication. I mean... Luke, or whoever wrote this, would have to be sort of an idiot to say one thing in chapter 15 and then decide, well, I'm going to take the same thing, I, you know, and just put it here. No, I think it happens twice. Might have been three times, four times, five times, six times. I think this is a monumental argument in the early church. Other, other thoughts or questions? Monumental argument. Yes. Well, I'll come back to you, Patty. One of those writings that Paul talks about, you know, is I will not pull another person away from the faith by eating meat in front of them. <laughs> Well, in Romans 8, Paul is confronted with the question about whether the Christians should eat meat sacrificed to idols. Because that's kind of, if you were going to go to a restaurant in Athens, chances are the restaurant is getting its food, at least the meat part, from a temple. 
where the animal would be taken in, the animal would be sacrificed, then it would be taken around the back, <laughs> finish the cooking, serve it up to the customers. So the natural question is, well, can we eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols? Now, the correct theological answer is, well, of course. Are there idols? I mean, are the idols real? When, when you sacrifice an animal to the goddess Athena, is anything actually happening there? No, there is no Athena. You might as well sacrifice it to that wall over there. Does it, it carries no significance. You've just done this bizarre act where you've offered up this animal to a figment of your spiritual imagination. But Paul goes on to say, well, however, for some people, for some new Christians, that whole thing represents like a violation of their conscience. And so you don't want to do that. You just don't do something that's going to have somebody violate their conscience. They're new in the faith. Someday they will learn it, but they don't now. And you don't want to be responsible for somebody violating their conscience and maybe, as a consequence, falling away from Jesus. So he says, don't eat the meat. Sort of like if, if you have this. I think in practice it would be like this. Let's say Paul's sitting at a table and it's him and his closest companions. They are all theologically grounded, well, mature in the faith. And somebody walks in, you know, with pork, <laughs> pork, I said pork chops, yeah. <laughs> That's cute. That's cute. Lamb chops. They come in with lamb chops. <laughs> they come in with lamb chops. And, and it's been sacrificed to the goddess Athena, the goddess of, Ro of Athens, you know. And so are they going to eat it? Of course they're going to eat it. They're all mature. But let's say there are at the table the next night some new Christians who are really struggling with this because Athena really isn't quite gone yet in their mind. Remember, the Gentiles are coming from a world filled with pagan gods and goddesses that are real to them. That's the way the world was. This monotheistic stuff with the Jews, that's the rare thing. The Jews are these weirdos who think there's only one God. And these weirdos who think further that this one God chose them, right? So everybody grows up knowing there's all kinds of gods and goddesses. So they have to unlearn that and set it up. And that's not easy. That's not easy. So I, I view Romans 8 as being a very, a very pastoral chapter, not a theological chapter. It's a pastoral chapter about the fact that people come into these house churches with a, with a variety of backgrounds. And some of them have been out a while, and some of them are brand new, and all that has to be taken into account. So, Patty, did you have something? I, I've ta I talked so long, you probably can't even remember. It was from the beginning of it, when you mentioned James. Somebody wanted to ask you, when did you think uh, James was martyred? James was martyred. The tradition is that James was martyred in the early 60s, like maybe 63. And where are we now? We're probably uh, 55, 56. So, I have one more question. Yeah. Do you think that these people... 57? <laughs> Yes, this is James and the elders who are come to Paul, and we're really glad to have you here, Paul. We have a problem. These, you know, I don't read this as being about a problem with the Jews in general, though they're included in this, but even among the Jewish believers. Okay, just that to me, that's the way the sentences flow. But certainly, the Jews in Jerusalem, they've got it out for Paul, right? That's why he had, didn't want to come. So now James and the elders are going to say to, are saying to Paul, Paul, look, this place is, is, is it's like a hotbed, and let's do this. 
these four guys, you're going to shave your heads, you're going to pay their expenses and try to help the Jews understand that you are still a righteous Jew, obedient to the law. Um, and that would be, I think, at the Jewish believers who I think have not given up their commitment to the law, which they don't have to, um, and as well as the reception Paul would get from the larger Jewish community. So Scott, at this meeting, this council meeting, I guess, there weren't any apostles there, obviously, or Mark probably would have mentioned it in his writing. So this was James over the church, not the apostle James, this was the head of the church, right? Are you talking about? You have James, the son of one, James and John are the sons of Zebedee. Okay, this is not that James. That's not, no, he, this right. is the half I believe that James is already dead, is he not? He might be. So this, so is, this James. is James, the half brother of Jesus, right. who became the head of the church. Um, Paul is certainly an, an, an apostle. As to who else might have been there, we're not told. But I would, I would think if we might have, we might have been told. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, I think this kind of caught Paul by surprise when he got there. See, I, I, I don't. I mean, Paul, Paul, see, you need to see the parallels between Paul and Jesus. Go back to chapter 20. When Paul goes out and they're warning him, warning him, warning him, warning him, warning him, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. And he says, I'm going, I'm going, I have to, I have to, I have to. And now he's there. It is this faithfulness to the vocation given him by God. It's not the same vocation as Jesus, right? But it's his vocation. And the question for, Mo, for Paul is, will he be faithful? So let's go back to the apostolic question, okay? And the tradition is that the apostles went out and did other things, okay? Mark was not an apostle. Mark is John Mark, the companion of, of Paul. So I think the apostle in view here is, is Paul. But as the years go on, what happens to the apostles, the original apostles? They all they, well, they scatter, and then what happens to them all? Oh, they all die. That means they all die, they're killed, they're martyred, yeah. right? So, and leaving, leaving an, apo an, apo <laughs> an apostolic office, in, an apostolic office in the church. Because when you look at the list of Paul's yeah. spiritual gifts, what do you find in there? Apostle, right. apostles, yeah. teachers, right? Because apostle is simply one sent by God to proclaim the word, right? Yeah. So in that way, Robert Hasley was an apostle sent from Highland Park up here to southern Oklahoma at the time <laughs> in order to start a church, right? Yeah. So, and, and, and Paul had that. We today in our world, we would call it entrepreneurial flair to start something get it going and so forth that's all at that's all apostolic yeah. kind like of work the, second time, Paul, the first time in galatians he had it with peter you know the confrontation with peter now yes and and he refers in galatians yeah. to an early yes yes and this got a confrontation with him in, in, in which illustrates what that this question of must the gentiles keep the law yeah. is so big that you really have to not view it as simply an arbitrary thing. And that's why I use that funny little sentence to say to myself, well, gosh, if it was good enough for Jesus, isn't it good enough for us? You know, in order to try to get inside the Judaizers' argument a little bit and not just see it, oh, well, they're just terrible people who don't understand anything, yada, 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 yada. No, I, I don't, think, I don't have, think I have to view them that way. Okay. Anything else, Patty? Well, the one other thing I'm thinking, too, is obviously Paul knows that, that James is Jesus' half-sibling. You would think. I would think somebody would have told Paul that, G that James is Jesus' younger half-brother, yes. Who, like, like Paul, came to faith in Jesus, his brother, after Jesus' death. Yes, which is something worth remembering. There's... For it seems that James and the brothers and sisters of 
Jesus came to faith after Jesus' death and resurrection. So I'm just wondering this whole, you know, the whole reason maybe that Paul did, you know, agree to all of this was because who the message was coming from also. Yes, that because now, it James, it's not good point. Paul is this apostle visited by Jesus on the road to Damascus, but is he going to submit himself to James's leadership of this church? What do you think? I think so. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. To me, that would, be the, that would be the Christian thing to do. Paul doesn't have a history with ch this church. He's been out there in the boonies. And this must be in Jerusalem, one of the, one of the bigger, of course, populations of Jews who've converted to, well, they're still Jews, but now they have faith in Jesus. Yeah, so, yeah, you see, you're, yeah, I can't use that word conversion, can you? No, 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 no. <laughs> My wife listens to me. It's a glorious and wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know. Yeah, James is like a big dog because you go back to the conference in Acts 15. Who's in charge of the conference? James. So I heard a voice over here first. I don't come back over here. Yes. What? What is the purpose of the? I think it's just a symbol of their dedication to God, being set apart for God, and they're going to make Paul part of that group, hoping that that results in. I don't know if there are particular actions they had to undertake. Um, I don't know. We're not told. The vow isn't even named. It's, the only thing we know about this vow is it's not like Samson. What was Samson's vow? That he wouldn't cut his hair. In this vow, they shaved their heads. Um, so, I mean, I mean, you could do the same. There's probably churches where people take vows now, like for the next month. I'm, I'm going to grow out my beard for the next, I'm not going to shave for the next month as a symbol of my dedication to um, something, God maybe. So that's a symbolic, but we, again, we wish we knew more, don't we? We wish we knew more. We're told very little. Only enough that obviously James and the elders believe that this vow, that this way with these four guys might well be enough to get Paul accepted by the Jews in Jerusalem, Christian and, and not. So then there was a hand over here. Yes. Isn't this what separates us from Jews right now? The, the difference of uh, following the law and being Christian? What separates us from Jews today, the law is secondary. The law follows. What separates from us from Jews today is that we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's what the membership button says in the body of Christ. And Jews have not. That is the starting point. Um, you work your way down, and you can get to different understandings of the law and so forth. But understand, even among Jews, there's a wide variation in the way that they understand the law in the 20th and in the 19th, 20th, and 21st century. You have the Reformed over on one side who have completely reimagined the law over to the ultra-Orthodox on the other side who attempt to keep the law in every single possible detail from the ancient world translated into the world of 2021 okay so but the focus is not on the law it is on Jesus okay anything else all right well verse 26 so the next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. That's why Paul brought his wallet. 
So we wish we knew more. I'm guessing there are scholars who make guesses about exactly what is happening here, but this is the implementation of the plan brought to them by James and the elders. Now, when the seven days were passed, so that now we know that's how long the purification is, no surprise there. Seven is a very common number. It is um, for purification rites and so forth. If, uh, if a Jew touched a dead body, they were unclean for a week, and they would have to go through some rituals to get clean. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. Now these are just, I take it that these are just, how can I say, just plain old not believing in Jesus Jews. Okay, so they've been up there. They might have encountered Paul or heard about Paul because of all his travels up there. Asia is, um, see how on the map there? Asia is Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. Well, they stirred up the whole crowd and they seized him and they shouted, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this place. Now that's a no-no. There's a... Um, there are places in the toll temple grounds where Gentiles can go, but not into the most innermost parts. And Paul, um, there's no reason to think that Paul wouldn't respect that. I would respect that. And we get a parenthesis. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed. What does assume make out of you and me <laughs> I don't even need to answer that do I and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple right and Trophimus is a companion of Paul's we meet him he's referred to elsewhere in Paul in Paul's letters at a few occasions um, he's a Gentile and no indication Paul brought him to a place where he shouldn't bring him Right? But people rush to assumptions. Um, people are, I think, are still, to me, it, it's just, again, very understandable that a lot of people are up in arms about this Jesus thing. It hasn't gone away, right? The, Je Je the Jewish community, which the, the Jesus community, which the Jewish leaders tried to stamp out right at the beginning. Remember, they're arresting James and John and the rest of them, trying to put it down. Remember, Paul himself went around trying to round them up, went to Damascus trying to round them up. <sighs> the community is still there. The community is growing. And I think there's still a lot of heat around it. In any event, they recognize Paul. That is something. They must, have he some, they must come from a place where Paul had gone into the synagogue and preached the good news of Jesus Christ. And what would their view be of Paul? Exactly what they said. Blasphemer. He's telling you that this dead, this dead Galilean was a Messiah. And more, that this dead Galilean was God himself. Ha! Ah, ripped the robe like Caiaphas and all the rest of it. A lot of heat. Verse 30. The whole city was aroused. You know, sometimes you read a phrase like that. It, it, the whole city was aroused. There were lots of folks aroused. Maybe the whole city, I don't know. Could have been. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. <laughs> why, do they, why do they come running? What are, they, what are they wanting to, to see, to experience? A spectacle, exactly. They want to come see the show, what's happening. Man, all right. Our lives don't change much day to day. Let's see what's happening. This, the, wow, big trouble, excitement. Seizing Paul, 
they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. So the crowd goes in, they get Paul. Now this is dangerous, right? This is like in the old westerns. You know, when some mob of people would want to head down to the jail, we're going to get them, we're going to bust them out, right? Stand aside, sheriff, we're going to get them. <laughs> Until what, ha what happens? Little Johnny steps forward <laughs> into the front of the crowd, and they're all ashamed, and they finally melt away and go home. <laughs> or sadly, you know, well, anyway. They dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him. This, if nothing else, that sentence tells me how much heat there is around this. This is not a peace-seeking debate that they want to have with Paul about Christology and Paul's you know, teachings about the nature of Jesus and on and on. That's not what they're, 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 the blood is up, they're hot, the crowd is worked up. I would bet you ever big the crowd is that most of them don't really have any idea what's going on. All they know is like, wow, wow, wow. This is what people do. This is why we talk about there being this darkness in the human heart. Because this happens way too easily. Still happens still happens. Of course it does, because there's still a darkness in the human heart. There will be until Jesus comes back. Well, while they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. I'm going to add a sentence. And the commander proceeded to sweat profusely. <laughs> <laughs> so why would the commander sweat profusely? Order. There's two jobs. Collect the taxes, keep the peace. Disorder is trouble. Why is disorder particularly a trouble for Rome? Well, no taxes. Why else? They have an empire. They have, you know, you usually view the Romans as these be conquerors just rolling over all these people. Usually they were invited in to settle disputes. That's how they ended up in, in, in Judea and Galilee and so forth, because they were invited in about 63 B.C. to settle a civil war. But once they arrived, they didn't leave. And so they had widely disparate peoples, particularly on the fringes of the empire and trouble um, threatened the security of the empire in the sense that if groups somewhere were successful, it would lead dissident groups otherwhere, rebel groups other places <coughs> to be successful. So they were very focused on keeping the peace. It is said that they ruled um, the empire with um, an iron hand covered by a velvet glove. An iron hand covered by a velvet glove. They just wanted the taxes collected. They wanted the peace kept. And now the peace is being threatened. Okay? So, back to what's actually written in the book of Acts, <laughs> verse 32. He at once, at once, took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Wow. Now, this treatment at the hands of the crowd is not some, it, it is something that Paul is used to. In 2 Corinthians 11, he lists some of these things, all these things that happened to him. And now he is in Jerusalem. He's a Pharisee who learned at the foot of Gamaliel, one of the great rabbis of the day, and this out-of-control mob, most of whom probably don't even understand what they're there for, they're just beating him. There is indeed a darkness in the human heart, but when the Romans come running, 
the crowd stops. Why? Authority. What? Authority. Authority. The Romans have all the weapons. The Romans have the soldiers. Swords. Swords. Spears. Spears. All of it. So the commander came up and arrested Paul and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He doesn't know what's going on, but this is going to put an end to it. He takes Paul, bounds, binds him with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd shouted one thing and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. What barracks? There you go. Right there, the Antonia Fortress, right there. <sighs> to get Paul away from these crowds because the commander needs to find out what is going on. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great they had to be carried by the soldiers. This is What does Luke convey to us here? This is a huge, violent mob scene. This is kind of like a riot. This is what happened in Ephesus, in the stadium there. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him, get rid of him, get rid of him. Sounds familiar. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, right? It, yeah, I, I think it, sh it should sound familiar. The parallel here is between Jesus and, and Paul. So when we come together next week, which we are next week, it's on the 15th of October that we won't be here. When we come together next week, we will just pick up right there, and Paul will begin to try to explain himself. Okay? So, any questions? Closing thoughts, questions. Yes, Ken. I don't know if this was the intent of Luke in writing this, but it seems to me I see it emerging that the future of the Christian church lies not with the Jews, but with the Gentiles. I don't, I don't know that Luke meant to write that. However, that is what would happen. But why does it happen? Why... Why does the movement become dominated by Gentiles? It's just sheer numbers. In the Roman Empire at this time, there's probably 60 million Gentiles. How many Jews? 500,000? Million maybe? So the movement becomes, the Jesus movement, the church becomes completely dominated by Gentiles because they bring big and bigger and bigger numbers until finally, with Constantine, the empire converts to Christianity. Of a sort, right? Of a sort, which we could talk about another time. All right, so um, I'll close this in prayer. Gracious Lord, as we leave here today, just hold us close. Um, um, be with Sandy tomorrow in her surgery. Be with our daughter-in-law, Courtney, tomorrow in her surgery. Um, be with the folks of Asheville and on that entire region. Be with the people of Israel. There's just so much, so much turmoil right now. But let us, but remind us that in you lies genuine peace and joy and nowhere else nowhere else and we're grateful for that we're grateful for your love for us and the gift of your son jesus christ and it's in his name we pray amen, amen.